God is holy and worthy of praise. Our ancestors trusted God and were delivered in their time of need. Although we often feel alone and tested, God has cared for us from the womb. Come, let us worship a God of infinite possibilities and boundless love. O oh God, our God, we confess that sometimes we feel you expect too much of us. Sometimes we feel challenged beyond our endurance. In this time of worship, help us to hear not only words of challenge, but also words of comfort and promise. May we see that Jesus understands our needs and all we're going through. And in this seeing, may we find hope and grace in times of need. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Morning. Good morning. The gospel reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one has left home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father or children, or fields for me, and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, Karen. My message this morning is entitled On the Rich Young Ruler, based on the scripture Karen read from Mark, the 10th chapter. I recently heard about an expert in diamonds who happened to be seated on an airplane beside a woman <coughs> with a huge diamond on her finger. Now finally, the man introduced himself and said, you know, I couldn't help but notice your beautiful diamond. I am an expert in precious stones. Please tell me about that stone. So she replied, that is the famous Klotman diamond, one of the largest in the world. But there's a strange curse that comes with it. 
Now the man was really interested. He asked, what exactly is that curse? Now as he waited with bated breath, she replied, it's Mr. Klopman. <laughs> Now, some of you may wish to reevaluate your diamonds on that particular basis. <laughs> but seriously, the true curse of any kind of valuable possession is its capacity to steal our hearts and our souls. Now, the rich young ruler is one of those unique characters from the Bible that have come to represent greed. He was so unwilling to part with his possessions that he sold his soul in order to keep his money. He wanted to be saved, but not at the expense of losing those possessions. Now, the first thing that impresses me when I read this story is that the rich young ruler was so near to the kingdom. You see, he asked all the right questions. He understood the law, and he understood Jesus' teaching. But in the end, love of money kept him out. Now, we've come to regard him as a moral coward. But that conclusion is way too simple. The fact is, there are a lot of good things that can be said of him. Now, I'm impressed with the fact, for example, that Mark tells us that having talked with him only a few minutes, Jesus looked upon him and loved him. Now, that doesn't sound like a scathing criticism to me. And I think that we also need to remember that to this young boy, Jesus was not the son of God. He was simply a new prophet with an exciting message, a magnetic personality, and eyes that gripped you when you spoke to him. He was certainly not the Christ of the Apostles' Creed. You see, at this point in his ministry, not even the disciples regarded Jesus that way. The stone of Easter had not yet been rolled away. And so for a few moments this morning, I'd like to speak on behalf of this underdog and to look at the three positives about this young man as well as the three negatives. First, let's look at the positive. These are things that brought him to the master, qualities that made him interested in Jesus' teaching. Now the first positive is this, he was courageous. Luke <laughs> describes him as a ruler, that is he belonged to the upper class. It's this group which brought the most criticism against Jesus. Perhaps it was his youth or his willingness to learn, but he didn't let his social position keep him from Jesus. He didn't buy into his peers' assessment of Jesus. Now, Nicodemus was another rich man who went to see Jesus, but he went by night under cover of darkness for that very same reason. He didn't want to be seen talking with the Nazarenes. Why? Because his peers might criticize him. But the rich young ruler was different. He didn't come skulking in the night. He came to Christ in broad noonday, and I believe that he saw something in Jesus and his teachings that convinced him that Jesus was the real thing. But how many of us have lowered our head and bitten our tongue when an opportunity arose to defend the church or to tell others about Jesus Christ? I dare say that many of us have. You see, we often lose courage and don't want to be seen as extremists. So I say that this young man did indeed have courage. The second positive thing is this. He was humble. When he came to Jesus, he came running, running. Now, elite people didn't run. That was considered undignified. But this rich young ruler ran up to Jesus and knelt before him in the middle of the road in broad daylight for all to see. Now, if his friends saw him, those within his social class, there'd be no end to the ridicule. But he didn't care. That makes him a man not only of courage, but of humility in my book. Now, notice what he asked. 
good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? He didn't come to Jesus with tricks or agendas. That was what the Pharisees did. They'd come before him and they would say, Jesus, what do you think about paying taxes to Caesar, for example? Jesus, what do you think about divorce? Jesus, what do you think about an afterlife? Why don't your disciples fast? Why don't they wash their hands? Why don't they obey the Sabbath? Now the fact is that they could not care less what he thought about any of those issues. The Pharisees thought that they had nothing at all to learn from Jesus. They were asking him these questions simply to trip him up and make him commit that one fatal verbal error that might hang him. You see, they were arrogant. How refreshing then to see someone who came in genuine sincerity. Good master, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now he was asking the right question. He had gotten down to the fundamentals. He was in effect saying, Jesus, you clearly have the secret of authentic living. Tell me the secret so that I might also be fulfilled. Now let us admit that far too often in the church, we are not humble. We spend time on issues that don't amount to a hill of beans while avoiding the eternal questions of life. <clears throat> far too often our motivation is not sincerity, but recognition and esteem. But that was not, not this young man's problem. He ran to Jesus. He knelt before him in the middle of the road and he asked sincere questions. He was humble. Now the third positive thing is this. He was religious. Now I don't mean that in a negative way. He was a spiritual man deeply concerned with religious things. Now when Jesus instructed him to keep the commandments, he answered, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now what did he mean? He meant that since the age of 13, and that's the point at which a Jewish boy assumes personal responsibility for keeping the commandments, he did indeed keep the commandments. How is that possible? Don't we as Christians assume that no one has ever kept all of the commandments? This is a critical part of this passage of scripture and the turning point in this young man's life. <clears throat> this is where the negatives begin to creep into this man's story. But before we get to that, let us remember that this young man was courageous. He didn't hide his interest in Jesus. He was humble. He came running to Jesus and in his nobleman's clothes, he knelt in the dust at Jesus' feet. And he was religious. He had kept the commandments from the age of accountability. But this is where the negatives start adding up in this young man's life. There are three I want to point out. But let's look closest at the first because it's the foundation of this young man's failure. The first negative thing is this. He was looking for a rule to keep in order to please God. Look at what he says. Listen now. What must I do to receive eternal life? What must I do? That's a pretty significant word, isn't it? Do. What rule must I keep in order for God to be pleased with me? You know the commandments, Jesus answered him. And then he started naming a few of them. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. And you can hear the frustration in the young man's words. Since I was a boy, I have kept all these, he answered. What am I doing wrong? A young man by the name of Martin Luther was just as confused as our young ruler. You see, he had no peace in his life. He was a monk who wanted to please God, but he felt like an awful sinner. Now on a trip to Rome, he encountered the church's corrupt practice of selling indulgences. 
That was the belief that financial contributions to the church could release loved ones from purgatory. Now he paid the fee to climb Pilate's stairs, the supposed staircase that Jesus climbed the day he was sentenced to death. There were 28 steps. You were to crawl on your hands and knees up all 28, stop on each step, and say the Pater Noster, the Lord's Prayer, on each. Luther kissed each step for good measure. At the 28th, the loved one you named was supposed to be released from purgatory. But when Luther got to the top of the steps, he said, who knows, who knows whether this is true? He doubted the effectiveness of such an action and his conscience still bothered him. It's like our rich young ruler. I have kept the commandments since childhood. What am I still doing wrong? Do you know what the fault is in both of these examples? The fatal flaw these young men shared? They were performing outward exercises to arrive at internal truth. They were conforming outwardly instead of obeying inwardly. They were living by law rather than by grace. That is what they were doing wrong. Now the second negative thing is this. He loved his money. He loved his money. Now it's interesting that Jesus, after being pressed by this young man, actually does give him something to do. Jesus says, you'll recall, you want something to do? All right. Since you have great wealth, sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and then come follow me. Now, I must admit that this is a little confusing because Jesus is trying to teach this young man that it's not outward acts that bring life, but inward obedience. So why, why does he tell him to do? If you look closely, you'll see that Jesus is conveying the difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Here in this text is another teaching of the great commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. Sell what you have to help the poor and come, follow me. Okay, many of you may remember Flip Wilson's TV comedy show back in the 70s. <laughs> One of his favorite characters to portray was a person called Brother Leroy. Brother Leroy. <laughs> now, in one skit, Brother Leroy was leading services one Sunday morning. It, it wasn't going particularly well, and people weren't very responsive. And it came time to receive the offering, and so Brother Leroy passed the collection plate, and it came back empty. <laughs> so he passed it again. Same thing, it came back empty. Brother Leroy then went before the people and said, now I know that you all want this church to progress. This church must progress. No response from the congregation at all. Brother Leroy shouted a bit louder, now before this church can progress, it has to crawl. This church has got to crawl. And the congregation started getting excited and they yelled back, make it crawl, Reverend, make it crawl. <laughs> Brother Leroy continued, after this church has crawled, it's got to pick itself up and start to walk. This church has got to walk. And the people again yelled back at him, make it walk, Reverend, make it walk. Well, after this church has walked, this church has got to get up and run. This church has got to run. And the people by that time were so worked up into a terrible frenzy and they hollered back, make it run, Reverend, make it run. And then Brother Leroy said, now, brothers and sisters, in order for the church to run, it's going to need money. <laughs> it's going to take money for the church to run. And the people yelled back, let it crawl, Reverend. <laughs> let it crawl.
Now, I understand how Brother Leroy feels. You see, it's sad when a church crawls in the dust, even though it should be running with the champions. The love of money prevents the love of God. You know what Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Now, the third negative thing is this. <clears throat> Pardon me. He walked away. He couldn't handle the truth when he heard it. He couldn't reshape his priorities. To love God and love your neighbor in such sacrificial and selfless ways was beyond him. I think he knew all along what was missing. He knew where his heart was. He didn't want to give up his lifestyle. He didn't want to part with his wealth. And when he retained his wealth, he relinquished eternity. Amen.